us pray. Heavenly let Father. Us pray. Heavenly let Father. Us pray. We have come from different works of life and backgrounds for an experience. For an experience. Give us a new experience that will empower us for the end time assignments for end time commissions to bring in the end time harvest of all in the name of your son Jesus let there be no misunderstanding let there be clarity let there be the understanding required to dismiss misunderstanding Give us illumination. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we be not sleep the sleep of death. Let the veil be destroyed in the name of Jesus. Let spiritual assassins and spiritual hijackers and spiritual arm robbers be barricaded in the name of Jesus. We break every resistance and opposition in the atmosphere. We proclaim and enforce and superimpose the Lordship of Jesus Christ over every argument, thought, reasoning, and imagination. We bring into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, let this eighteen vessel be deployed and engaged by the Holy Spirit and by the treasure within to speak as you will want me to speak to speak as an oracle of Adonai break chains destroy yoke set loose these potential leaders of the next generation leadership in Jesus name Amen thank you please be seated it's good to be with you and um, I want to take the opportunity to thank God and celebrate the Bishop of the House, Bishop Titi Offer. He's a great guy. <clears throat> He's a great guy. Thank you for honoring him. Thank you for honoring him. Whenever you honor anyone God has honored, you yourself have sown a seed of honor. And you cannot be dishonored when you honor one that God has honored. And so thank you for honoring him. Thank you. Please be seated in heavenly places. It's good to be with you. And um, Bishop, this is good. Very nice. Thank you. Amen. Bishop is a builder. He's always building and always doing something new. It's powerful. Amen. I was just talking to Bishop Doug on the way and I was telling him that among all of us charismatic pastors, bishop, whatever, he is the mega builder among us as all that you can you can catch up with bishop dark you just can't catch up with him just when you think you are beginning to do something or you realize that the man is many 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 steps ahead of projects nobody builds like bishop dark he too that is his anointing and i think we should we should have him build a special consulting office of church growth building buying properties and multiplying churches he too that is his anointing and i think that is a blessing that he made time to come and to bless you i was telling bishop in tefos church uh, yesterday when i was with them about bishop dad and I'm saying a lot of people believe that uh, Young Gicho's system is what Bishop Dag is working. There is there's truth in it, but it's not 100% truth. 
because I knew Bishop Dag when he was in Achimota school. He used to come to my services and he used to play my red organ for me. The first organ I had in action was red and Bishop Dag used to play it. And something I learned right from that time when he was in Achimota school was that he brought students from Achimota, he buzzed them. He brought them in buses to action. In buses. So, I mean, it is true that he learned a lot from Dr. Yongicho, but for whatever reason, even before he came into full-time ministry to understand that God had called him to grow churches and multiply churches, God had already given him some kind of a passion and a desire and a calling and an anointing to go for souls and not just invite them to church, but to bust them to church. To bring them to church in buses. So, it's a passion and a calling that has always been with him. And uh, I felt like he should be celebrated for what God is doing with him. So, put your hands together for that. I think that one of the signs of true maturity is to get to a place in our walk where we begin to appreciate whether it's sons or colleagues or brothers or friends or fathers or mothers, we have to get to a place where we begin to celebrate one another. Oh, you are not clapping, crowd. Are you jealous? Then if you are not jealous, why are you not clapping? <clears throat> Hear me? Celebrating the successes of others doesn't diminish your anointing. It does not take anything from you. As a matter of fact, it buys you goodwill. Are you hearing me, somebody? This is my first time of being here and to see what Bishop has done apart from what he's doing there and this is something that needs to be celebrated and appreciated come on somebody yeah amen please be seated not so many ministers do that so many pastors will go and buy a house and buy some latest car to show off but the tea of faith is not like that he's building expanding and that is what it's all about amen so once again thank you for who you are we honor you even though i'm your father i have a lot of respect for you for what you do for god i do Um, whatever he's doing I'm part of it I don't need invitation whenever he says Papa I need you to come I tell my office say yes but your schedule I say don't worry about my schedule just say yes I have to attend you know because he's a true son Amen. Please be seated. I had a very important meeting at one o'clock. And I had to, the person flew down from outside to see me. Very, very important dignitary. And I said, I'm sorry. We have to discontinue this meeting. We have to meet another time because I have a very important meeting. To, then I have another one at three. Very important dignitary. And I said to my office, they have to wait. If I'm not that three, they must wait because I have to honor the subtlety of her. Please be seated. I believe that it is time for fathers to stop killing their sons. And I think it's also time for sons to stop undermining their father. Because there is no need to undermine your father. 
what your father has is yours. There was no need for Absalom to circumvent his father. Because even when he was doing everything to kill the father and to remove him from the throne, the father was still looking out for him and gave instruction to Joab and said, don't touch him. Don't kill him. Even though he was looking for an occasion to kill the father, the father gave instructions, don't kill him. And David punished Joab for killing Absalom. So it's time for sons to stop undermining their father for numbers or for breakthrough. There's no need to undermine your father. Where your father is, don't go and try and eat there. I'm speaking in parable now. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I've seen people who literally ministers will investigate to find out who are the people supporting Papa. Who are the gurus and the moguls in his church. And they will do strategic evangelism. Strategic evangelism. To reach those people with a prophetic word, even when God hasn't spoken. With revelation and deep insights. Just, and then they start inviting them, especially when I give them my platform. They start inviting strategic people in my church. To their programs, to their meeting, and start giving them prophetic word. And they won't even call me and say, Papa, I picked this about so and so in your church. Before I realized that person is has become their friend, doing things for them. And I look at that as lack of understanding. You don't understand. Because you can't undermine your father and become one. You can never be a father when you undermine a father. Understand that. And listen. You only attract what you honor. You never attract what you despise. You cannot attract what you undermine. You forfeit whatever you dishonor and you despise. And what you don't value, you forfeit. You only attract what you value. And I believe I'm speaking to potential leaders of tomorrow. I'm talking to next generation leaders. I want to talk to you about some few information on this book. Don't fight the process. Don't fight the process. Tell somebody, go through the process. The father factor. I said some few things out of this. The father factor. You must get it. It will bless you. And then, praying through the promises of God. Praying through the promises of God. It will help you to understand that prayer thank you bishop that prayer is agreeing with god prayer is being in partnership with god prayer is working with god prayer is becoming a partner with god to carry out eternal legislations and decrees as it relates to the matters of planet earth so when you become an intercessor, you are in partnership and in agreement with God and you work for God. And prayer or intercession is the highest calling in the body of Christ. Because Jesus worked for three, 33 years, fulfilled his mandate, and for over 2,000 years, he ever lives to make intercession for those of us who came to God through him. Because we are operating in enemy's territory. It's another message for another day. But I'd like to talk to you about process. Because the value of everything in life has to do with process. It is the process that determines your value. The difference between a soldier in the army and a ranger and a seal is the process they went through. Preparation, process. Is what determines your placement and your positions. Process will determine the level of grace and oil and anointing you can handle. Process will determine how much pressure you can take. 
I see a lot of young pastors. They want to be big, and it's good to be big. But being big can kill you. Yeah. Being big can kill you prematurely. If you haven't developed the muscles, if you haven't developed the capacity, if you haven't developed enough ability and grace to endure My God. the greatness can kill you. And I want you, some of the things I'm going to say, I've been learning it for 45 years. And you don't have to learn it. You can just take it from where it is and run with it. And hear me. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, there are so many things that a lot of preachers want that I don't like. And I don't want it because I've been there before. I walked away from it. There are some invitations I don't want. There are some breakthroughs and great things and affirmation and accolades and relevance that I don't want. I don't need them. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I was telling my son the other day, I said, there is no amount of buildings and crowd that impresses me. Because I have an understanding that heaven's definition of success is different from man's definition of success. And the things we praise and the things we are crazy about does not impress God. The things that impresses God are very, very simple things. And I want you to build into your ministry some value systems. And have an understanding because where there is understanding, misunderstanding is eradicated. Whenever you see misunderstanding anywhere between a husband and a wife or a family or a church or political leaders, it's lack of understanding of an issue or a matter or a purpose. See, I hear you. Please write this thing down. That God has not called us to be powerful, but he has called us to be faithful. So hear me. You want to last in ministry, don't seek to be powerful. Seek to be faithful. A lot of people want to be anointed. Anointing is good. But if you want anointing, be faithful. God has not called us to be anointed. He has not called us to be successful. Neither has he called us to be gifted or powerful. He called us to be faithful. And when you are faithful, you go far. When you are faithful, you go far. And faithfulness is a product of process. Because when you've been processed, brings the best out of you. Gold is not gold until it goes through process. It goes through fire. The Bible said, out of the furnace of affliction have thou been chosen. Out of the furnace of afflictions have I chosen you. And the difference between the first Adam and the last Adam is the fact that the first Adam was made overnight. And he was not subject to any process. So he didn't have value for what he had. If you have not been processed, you will not value the oil you carry. You won't value what God has entrusted into your hands because you haven't been processed. Jesus learned obedience through the many things he suffered. You never appreciate and understand accountability and compliance until you suffered something. The lack of understanding of principles. I was talking to a group of ministers and I said, 
You all want your members to tight, but how many of you tight? And I'm putting it to you. I'm putting it to you. Do you tight? Do you tight personally? And do you tight on the tight of your church to another that is higher than you? Because Abraham tied to Melchizedek, one that was higher than him. And when the angel met Mary, the angel said to Mary, your cousin Elizabeth called barren, she's six months pregnant. And so when your pregnancy begins, go spend time with Elizabeth because she's more pregnant than you. You know what the problem is in the church? We want to hang with people that we are more anointed than. Whether it's in the church, whether it's in politics, at the marketplace, we always want to be surrounded with people that look up to us. People that we are more anointed than. And if you are that kind of a leader, you won't do well. You must be surrounded with people like David had a man called Ahitophel from the land of Gilead. And the Bible said when Ahitophel spoke, it was as if a man has heard the oracles of God. Where are the Ahitophels around leadership today? We don't want to hang with people who are more anointed than us. We want to hang with sycophants, parasites, people who will call us and tell us what we want to hear. People who can't speak truth to power. And if you are that kind, you won't go far. If you want to go far in ministry, honor those who are more anointed than you. And bless them financially, not with lip services. I have a lot of sons all over the world. And especially the Ghanaians, sons all over the world. They, they, they honor me with their lips. Thank God Bishop Doug is not like that and Bishop Titi of is not like that. And Isudanaba is not like So many of them are not like that. But so many of them is the Alephs. They haven't learned to sow into one that is more anointed than them. Years ago when I lived in America, we couldn't pay our bills, our rent, my staff. We didn't have money. And I was praying, and the Lord said, don't pray for money. Don't pray for money. Don't ask me for money. Money is on earth. It's not in heaven. <laughs> and I said, how do I get it? I need money. And he said, have I not said, give, and it shall be given. Mm -hmm. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. Shall men, men, so he said, qualify, fulfill the terms of the covenant, and then you can command, and angels will go on assignment. Hebrews 1.14. If you look at Hebrews 1.14, he says something very interesting. Hebrews 1.14, he talks about the ministering spirits. Are they not all ministering spirits? Mm -hmm. Send forth to minister. Mm -hmm. For them who shall be the send heirs. for to minister, send for to minister. Talk to me, send for to minister for them. To did he say to to them? So did he say to them? To. No, he said for them, say for them, for them. So there are ministering angels when we do what the word says, they are under obligation to perform the word, they go working on our behalf for them. They work on our behalf, but we must fulfill the terms of the covenant. Because when it comes to financial blessings, it's conditional. Anyway, the Lord said to me, send a seat to Bishop T.D. Jakes. And I said, no, 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 no. Bishop T.D. Jakes is a mega millionaire. The man is loaded. Even when he coughs, he makes money. When he's sleeping, he makes money. I need money, and how do I give to Bishop T.D. Jakes? And the Lord said, unto you honor and soul to one that is blessed than you, you will never experience and be a partaker of that blessing. 
So if you want the blessing of the blesser, for without contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And I lived in America in those days. And I was struggling. Bishop Jess wasn't struggling at all. One time, we went for lunch. We were driving. And he said to me, how are things? And I said, ministry-wise, is great. But financially, I'm not doing well. He didn't say anything. I thought he was going to sign a check for me. You know what he did? He invited me to preach for him. And when I went to preach, he blessed me. Then he gave me a lot of opportunity to preach. Put me on a lot of TV stations in America to minister. That was his way of helping me financially. That he wasn't going to give me money. Let your gift make room for you. So he opened doors for me and expected the doors he had opened for me to give me what I needed. Because what I have is given to me to bring to me what I don't have. So I told my office, I said, Joan, send a check of $10,000 to Bishop Jakes. And she said, Papa, we haven't paid our bills. Are you sure about what you are doing? I said, do it before I change my mind. <laughs> if you don't do it, I will change my mind. And if I change my mind, too, it may not help us. So just go ahead and do it. So I called Bishop Jakes' office and I said, Beg, I just sent a check to Bishop. As soon as he gets to the office, can you put it in his hands and call me? So... The check got to him. She called me and said, I've given it to him. So then I said, let there be a performance. Let there be a performance. Of the word of the Lord, let there be a performance. For it is written, God cannot lie. And I said, furthermore, the scriptures cannot be broken. And it is written, the grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And forever, oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So let there be a performance. Somebody say, let there be a performance. Put your hands together and say, let there be a performance. Amen. Amen. Sit down for two minutes. Hear me. Few days after, one of my sons, he's an American, he's in business. He lives in San Diego. He called me. He said, Papa, where are you? I said, I'm in Maryland. He said, I have to see you. I said, why? He said, the Lord told me to bless your ministry. So I'm coming with red eye. Pick me up at BWI in the morning. So in the morning, I picked him up. We went for breakfast. He said, the Lord told me to give your ministry $50,000. And that was exactly what I needed, $50,000 to pay the bill. That was exactly what I needed. So checked him to his hotel, went doing things. And I picked him up the next morning to have breakfast before we took him to the airport. And I said, did you sleep well? He said, no, I didn't sleep well. I said, what happened? He said, the Lord told me to give your ministry $100,000, but I didn't want to do it. So last night, I did not sleep. This is another $50,000. Hear me? I'm teaching you practical things that will help you survive in ministry. Because ministry is tough. I'm telling you. Say process. It is the process you've been through that determines your value at the marketplace. There was a time I would be invited to preach in Europe, in Canada, America, all over the world. And when I finished preaching, I remember I went to preach in a church in North Carolina, an Assemblies of God church. Great move of God, miracles. I haven't seen that kind for a long time. People were getting up from wheelchair, throwing crutches all over. I mean, the Holy Spirit was just doing his own thing, and it had nothing to do with me. I wasn't praying for miracles. God was just having his way, doing some strange things. And when I was going to that church, I didn't have money to buy tickets, so I borrowed the ticket. And I was hoping that I'll be so blessed that when I come back, I'll pay the ticket. When the man finished, my ticket 
was $1,500. He gave me $900 as my love offering. And I was very sad. I felt very sad for myself. And I felt very sad for my children. I felt very sad. I'm talking about I was sad to the point of depression. I did not want to eat that day. They invited me for lunch and I said, no, I'm okay. I went to my hotel. I couldn't order food. I lost appetite to eat. I was thinking about how I would pay the telephone bill. I have bills to pay back home. And my ticket. No love offering. And I said, this man is a wicked man. Like the Nigerian said, wicked. After this great move of God, he gave me $900. So I decided to sleep. And I was sleeping and the sleep wasn't coming. And I rebuked insomnia. It was not insomnia. It was disappointment and frustration. It was lack of kwachabamba. Somebody say kwacha, kwacha. Why is I was lying there, tossing back and forth. My phone rang. And I picked it up. And a lady came on and I said, I'm Claude. Do you remember me? And I said, no. She said, I'm the lady you prayed for concerning my inheritance. Who works at the World Bank. I'm traveling to Haiti. I have a check from you. Where are you? And I said, I'm in North Carolina. She said, she's leaving the next day. I said, what time? She said, in the afternoon. I said, I will meet you first thing tomorrow morning. <laughs> I prayed for the Holy Ghost to protect her. Send angels to preserve her. And it's something you have to do. You have to start praying for your divine helpers in advance. That whoever God has commanded to bless you, wherever they are, let them be protected until you meet them. And when you meet them, let them release the quarter. Do you remember that when God sent the prophet to the woman of Zarephan, God said, I have commanded the widows to sustain you. She was commanded. And the prophet had to give her further instructions. She wasn't going to do it. And even when the prophet spoke to her, sit down, she was still explaining her circumstances. So it wasn't something that she wanted to do. So you have to pray for anybody because I've seen people who came to me when they were broke. And one time I said to the Lord, why? Why is it that they all come to me when they are broke and they are in trouble? From politicians to businessmen, you name it. And people in ministry, they come when they don't have money. And, and, and I asked them, why didn't you come and see me when you were loaded? And they'll tell me, I don't know why. And I said, do you think that me, my anointing is to fix people who are broke? Why is it that you don't come to me when you are loaded? I'm because some of you will face it. I'm telling you. And the Lord said, pray in advance to protect those I have commanded to bless you. And he said, block the evil eye. Number two, rebuke familiar spirits. Number three, arrest monitoring spirits. Because the evil eye sees, familiar spirit know things. Monitoring spirit will monitor your blessings. This is not for everybody, but it's for somebody. Because some of the things I'm telling you, you won't read it in any book. When we're writing books, we don't put this thing there. We put all the nice things there. Mm -hmm. But there are practical issues. So, <clears throat> first thing in the morning, I took the first flight. I got to BWI. I didn't go for my suitcase. I ignored my luggage and I ran outside. And called her and she told me where she was. And I showed her where I was. She came, she gave me an envelope, 
I open it, $85,000. I prayed for her and I felt the anointing. There was something about the oil when I saw the check. Uh -huh. And I said, you, you will never have problem with money as long as you live. And I said, you will always have and you will always remember me and so to my ministry before anybody else in the name of Jesus. I bless the angel. 85 dollars. Say dollars. Say quacha. As soon as I cash the check, and my office said it has cleared in the account. My anointing came back. The discouragement left me. I became very bold and confident. Poverty is not good. Hallelujah. Say, I hear you. Say, process. The first Adam was made overnight. No process. He didn't have value of the divine mandate. He's in my book. Prayer moves God. The divine mandate over this head. He ceded it to Satan. And Jesus recognized and called him the prince of this world. Adam made him the prince of this world. And Satan said in Luke 4, 5 and 6 to Jesus, the kingdoms, the glory, the power that you see was delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Who delivered it to him? Adam. Adam made him the God of this world. No process people are dangerous people. Men of God, women of God, who haven't been through process, are very dangerous people when they come into success and when they come into relevance. And when they are power, they are dangerous. Many years ago, I was invited to speak in a conference in America. It was a huge platform. And when I saw all the people on the platform, they have been in ministry 20, 30 years ahead of me. These were seizing ministers, loaded deep wells. And I was asked to speak. Through a contact I had, I knew in myself that standing on that platform was spiritual suicide. But the opportunity was huge. I couldn't walk away from it. So I went for it. And I performed to the best of my ability. But I didn't meet the standard. They didn't invite me again. And I was told that they won't invite you again. Because there are protocol and rules of engagement. It's not every platform you can go and stand on it. That's why when Saul gave his armor to David, David said, this one, I have not proven it. Let me go with what I have processed and used and handled. And I'm used to this one. I haven't yet tested it, proven it, so I can't touch it. It's not every platform you can stand on because you are invited. When I invite you to action, or Bishop Doug invites you to action, you should go and do 40 days and 40 nights. I'm telling you. Because those are not platforms. You just come and stand there and preach somewhere and come and give us prophecy. Do you know the amount of prophecies I have heard and prophesied myself? A prophet came to me, a young prophet came to me. I gave him an opportunity to come to my office. He came down on his knees and he saw some vision about me. And, and I said to him, I said, young prophet, young man. I said, this is your prophecy. I'm not buying it. I was not born yesterday. And I said, I refute. I annul. Negate and quash. Override and overturn. Bring to a halt and into permanent captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
And I said, you never step foot in my office again. Who do you think you are? I give you access and you come and you have the audacity to allow yourself to be used to project the enemy's intentions of me. I said, God has been spoken through you and by you. And the problem is that we have all forgotten that we have the right to judge prophecy. That when one is prophesying, let the others judge. So we can judge prophecy. And every prophecy is conditional. The fact that you saw it or you heard it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Are you hearing me? And when, when the prophet Isaiah went to King Hezekiah and told him, please be seated. That says the Lord. Set your house in order and you will die. He didn't ask the prophet to pray for him. He didn't ask the prophet to give him a quantire. He turned to God himself and settled the matter with God. And then God said, I have changed the decision. And God told the prophet, go back and tell him he has 15 more years to live. Are you hearing me? Another prophet came to me. Brother, word of the Lord, it was accurate. When he finished, he said, that, and the Lord said, I should tell you to give me this amount of money. And I said, what is wrong with you? I said, what is wrong with you? I said, I, I had already planned to bless you. But because of what you have said, I feel like blessing you and slapping you on top. That is my humanity. That is not my divinity. That is my humanity. Somebody say, I hear, you. I hear you. David, David, went through process for about 17 years. The first time he was anointed before all his brethren. That was the first anointing. Very gifted. Second time, anointed before all of Judah. Third anointing. Before all of Israel. During this time, he had killed the lion and the bear. He had killed Goliath, but he was still not king. Because he had to go through process in order for him to endure and survive for 40 years on the throne. Your longevity and how long you live has everything to do with your preparation and the process you've been through and allow yourself to go through. You know what I mean? Ministry is not about being powerful. It's not about gift or anointing. It's about understanding process and divine protocols. I had a very young man in my church that God blessed. He became a millionaire. Anytime I went to his office, every man of God in town was there. Everybody was there. And I asked him, I said, why, why, why is everybody here? He said, are you jealous? I said, I'm not jealous. But I don't understand. I said, what you are doing is, you have resigned your spiritual responsibility and you have outsourced your spirituality, your spiritual growth, and your faith to this man of God through gifts and money you give to all of them. You have outsourced your spiritual growth and development to them. You can never grow and increase by giving everybody money, being chairman of, and everybody was inviting him. And when I talked, he said I was jealous. And I said, you know something? You are dealing with the wrong person. Carry long story short, he lost everything. He became bankrupt. All the men of God who used to go there stopped going there. And I told him, I said, these people, they don't care about you. I said, I knew you before you made money. And I said, I am the friend you had before you made money. So your money don't move me. It's relationship that moves me. Say process. People who have been bring to process are dangerous people. Especially when they succeed. Somebody said to me, the other, I say, Papa, how come when people have money and power and influence and relevance, they change? 
And I said, it's not true. Power, money, relevant, don't change anybody. It amplifies what was in them. So when you see people misbehaving, mishandling people, it has always been in them. But it is the power, the relevance, and the money that amplifies and brings out what was always in them. When you see people disrespect people, dishonor elders, talk any way, anyhow, when they've come into abundance and they've come into money, it's because it has always been there. But power, money, relevance, influence, connection will reveal what is in your heart. And for those of you who are prophets, when you see you are ministering and you see a casket, don't tell somebody I see you in a casket. You see, you are killing the person's faith. Tell him that I see a life-threatening situation program against you and we need to terminate it. Give people hope. Give them hope. Don't, don't paint a picture and put fear in them and then expect them to have faith to fight. They can't fight it. Because when you do that, what you have done is that <clears throat> you have <clears throat> created a situation for them to outsource the outcome of their future to you. So now you have to pray for them. And then when you say, I don't see you in casket anymore. I see you now. You've made it. You've broken through. Then their faith comes back. It's a manipulation. It's not good. Don't do that. The difference between David and Saul is this. Saul became king overnight. So he didn't value what he had. David went through process. If you don't go through process, you will not value what you have. It is process that determines placements. It is process that determines future positionings in life. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah could carry double of the mantle of Elijah because he had been through process. Somebody talk to me, say process. Come on, talk to me, say process. Somebody say process. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, there are some things that I thank God that I wasn't exposed to five years ago, even two years ago. Because some of the favors and some of the opportunity God has given me across the nations of the world, if I had it five years ago, I would have destroyed myself. Because I wasn't seizing. I would have told the whole world, one of my secretaries, I left my phone and it rang and she picked it and after, for whatever reason, she went through my phone and she saw some names and numbers and she said, hey, Papa. She saw Texas and she said, Papa, you know all these people? And I said, never. 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 You do this again. Before, I want everybody to know who I know. You have a problem of insecurity and you are an amateur. When you've come of age and you are seasoned and you are mature, you don't want people to know. Somebody said, 
How can you deal with every president that has come in Ghana and many parts of the world? It's because I understand the principle of honor. What you honor, you will attract. What you dishonor, you forfeit. So when you use your pulpit insulting politicians, you use your pulpit to insult other ministers, and you use your pulpit to insult people, you don't attract them. And don't think that using the pulpit to attack politicians and to preach against corruption and attack people who are doing bad things makes you powerful. Many years ago, there was a young man in this country. He was very powerful. And he, he used to attack a particular president. So one time, somebody around that president called me and said, I'm a bishop. I was then a bishop. He said, Bishop. Do you know that young man? See, I know him. He comes to buy my tape every week. He preaches my messages. He said, please talk to him. Because if he doesn't stop what he's doing, something bad may happen to him. He was very powerful. He had all this business and the women giving him money. Quacha. Young man loaded with quacha. With all kinds of cars and he was doing big things. Had branches everywhere. I tried to reach him, but at a point, when I look at his attitude and everything, I did what I could, but I had to leave it. He died prematurely, and I won't go into the details. When I go into the details, you know who. He died prematurely. I had a friend of mine, went to the same Bible school with him. He used to work for Reverend Mensah, Full Gospel International, Tema. And the old man was a father to me. One time I went to Tema to see him. He was at Teburi. He was always there praying fasting. So I went to see him. And he said to me, he said, Nick, 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 Nick. Talk to your brother, Seth. Talk to him. And he spoke in God. He said, Talk to your brother, Seth. Talk to him. So I got set to come see me. He came to see me in my office and I said, listen, I just spoke to the old man. I don't like the way he was talking about you. I don't like it. And I said, these old men, they know something we don't know. So whatever it is, just make peace. He said, I've determined I'm going to resign. I said, you know something, let me help you do something. For you to resign and start your own ministry in the same city to bring division, I will arrange a scholarship for you. Go to Christ for all nations. <clears throat> when you get there, write and resign. By the time you come back for five years, <clears throat> you'll be off their radar. But to resign and start another church in the same city and divide the flock is not good for you, my friend. He said he disagrees with me. He has built a church. He can do whatever he wants to say. Okay. So he left my office, and one of my pastors went with him to sit in the car. So I told him, call me, Leslie, tell him to come back. So he said, don't go with him, let him go. He took off. He was on the motorway, had an accident, went into coma, never made it, and died. When the old man heard it, he said, Nicholas, thank you. In Kebakakilalwe. He was very anointed. Very gifted. But he did not understand the protocols of God. Hear me. The Bible said, the children of Israel, they knew the works or the acts or the wonders of God, but they did not know the ways of God. There's a difference between the ways of God and the miracles of God. We override those projections. We override the evil eye. We override demonic imaginations and statements in the atmosphere. In the name of Jesus, we ground the enemy. Motaluka Walahasa. Iyala munda vanda sakun 
Sit down for two minutes. Somebody say process. You know, every race in life, we run with speed. Say speed. There's only one race. That speed is not required. And it's ministry. Running the race with what? Patience. Say patience. Say patience. Say endurance. Say perseverance. Say steadfastness. Yeah, it's required for longevity. Hear me? Joseph. Joseph. And his brothers. Nobody could dream until Joseph was given the coat of many colors. And let me tell you something, young ministers. Young men don't dream. They see visions. They don't dream. They see visions. But the coat of many colors of the old man gave Joseph the divine capabilities to dream. When nobody could dream. And let me tell you something. The fulfillment of the vision of the young man is in the fulfillment of the old man's dream. Because vision is foresight. Dream is insight. And you might have great vision, but you need the insight of the old man. That's what the Bible says. That I will turn the heart of the fathers to the children. And the heart of the children to the fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This disconnect between fathers and sons has weakened this movement. Success doesn't make you a father. Mahasunda. Alayakutum. Devuluku walahasi malusa. I wrote many books and I've done a lot of things that my father did. And yet... I am not his father. Even in his death, he's still my dad. How dare you think your anointing and your achievement in life gives you the audacity to disrespect and dishonor the hand that was laid upon you and the hand that fed you? Joshua was in the valley with the armies of Israel Fighting Amalek, winning the battle, but it wasn't him that was winning the battle. It was the hand of the old man Moses upon the top of the mountain that empowered them to win the battle. Joshua did what Moses couldn't do. Elijah performed twice miracles, 14 miracles than his father. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, it wasn't the sons that were talking to the father. It was the fathers that were talking to Jesus, not the sons. You have to be very careful that you don't define yourself as a father on the grounds of anointing or gift or success. Success and anointing and gift doesn't make you a father. The place of a father is a divine ordination. It's an ordination. So stop calling yourself Papa. Some of you, you haven't even killed a mosquito yet. And a fly. You're calling yourself Papa. There can be many, I don't care. Because the fact of the matter is that whether you call me Papa, you call me Archbishop, you call me Man of God, I don't care. Hear me? You get to a place when all that matters is for you pleasing the Father. That's it. Nothing matters anymore but for me to impact the next generation. Nothing matters anymore but to hand over the baton when it is time, not now. I'm not going anywhere yet, so if you've been having some dreams, keep it to yourself. I ain't going nowhere. Say, I hear you. 
I'm walking in the Simeonic benedictions and blessings. Are you hearing me, somebody? I am not going yet until the things that were spoken and written of me in the volumes of the books in eternity long before time began has come into full effect. And when it is time, I will depart on my own terms. According to the revelation of heaven. So those of you who have been having some revelations and dreams, not me. It's somebody, it's you. It's you you are seeing, not me. That prophecy is for you, it's not for me. Sit down. Before David faced Goliath, he had killed a lion and a bear. Whatever you are managing, handling, battling with right now, will determine what confronts you in the future. And whether you fight a lion or a Goliath has everything to do with how successful you manage and handle what is entrusted into your hand. For he that is faithful in little shall be faithful in much. Don't seek to be anybody. Don't. Don't compete with anybody in the ministry. Don't do it. And one thing you must also learn. Look at the life of David. David was not vindictive. David was forgiven. David was quick to repent. David did not hold grudges. David was not offended. He wasn't going around with unforgiveness and offenses in his heart. He did not compete with Saul. Even though there was 24 assassination attempt on the life of David by Saul. He did not seek to kill David. And when even he had the opportunity to kill David. He understood that vengeance to kill Saul. He understood that vengeance is the Lord. He didn't touch him. You know why? When he took Belsheba and killed Uriah the Hittite, his mighty men did not kill him. Because they saw how he handled Saul, even when God delivered Saul into his hands. That's why they didn't touch him. If he had killed Saul, when he took Belsheba and killed Uriah, his mighty men would have killed him. People around you are watching you. They are watching your style. And remember you read what you saw? If he had killed the king, he would have sown the seed for his mighty men to kill him. But because he didn't kill him, nobody could kill him. I didn't kill any father of mine. And therefore no son can kill me. I haven't sown any seed to reap it. And I'm not reaping what I haven't sown. My gadula me talu Joseph If you look at all Joseph's brothers I understand why He was chosen And not any of his brothers None of them understood process And if you don't agree with me Watch The end of the book of Genesis And see when Jacob died, the Bible said that Joseph was the only one that laid his head on the chest of his father and wept. All the others were quiet. Nobody wept. You know why? They haven't been through process. They were not separated from my father. They hadn't been in a foreign land all alone. They hadn't been misunderstood. They haven't been framed. They haven't been implicated. And they hadn't been to prison. And they hadn't been without a father to understand and appreciate the value of a father. So when the old man died, they were all standing there more worried about what Joseph would do to them because of what they did to Joseph than worrying about the fact that 
the man that kept us together has finally departed. The Bible said it was only Joseph who put his head on the chest of the old man and wept. Elijah had double portion because he went through process. And when he asked for the double portion, he said, if you see me go, if you can tarry, if you can endure the last process you have to go through, the mantle is yours. This generation, we don't want to go through process. We don't serve anybody. We don't sow into anybody. A lot of you ministers here have benefited from bishop. I hope you are not just coming to be blessed. Take pictures of this and go back to try and do the same thing. That is fine. But at least sow a seed. Say, Bishop, this is a seed from our ministry. We want to partake of the blessing of God on your life. For whatever reason, the Ghanaian Christians are very stingy. And especially the Ghanaian men of God. And hear me, I have authority to speak. You can't do me anything. <laughs> Spiritually or physically, you can't do me shelly. I'll block you. I will block your prayers, block your imagination, block your thoughts, your arrows, your fiery darts, your ill wills, your projection, your statement. I will block you from the throne room perspective by divine authority. So don't even try it. Tell somebody, don't try the old man who don't try him. Because I know things you don't know. The Nigerian Christians know some things. I'm telling you. <clears throat> they understand the protocols, of the protocols of the kingdom. It blows my mind. They come to your office and they say, Papa, first of all, I can't come before greatness without a seed. And they'll put a seed on the ground. And when I talk about the seed, I'm talking about rear kwacha loaded, pregnant. The Ghanaian Christians, they come empty handed and those who come with kwacha they come like this papa no go fi o the big it baby one of my pastors came to papa no go fi every year no go. so one day he came and I said hey, hey steve take your fi away do i look like fi i'm not your fi carry your seed and your fi get out of my office with your fi you think i'm sitting down here waiting for your fi carry it away and i sack him with his fi But it's a false humility created out of a foolish, ignorant mentality. It's foolishness. It permits people to misbehave and to stay selfish and greed or greedy. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you. It will bless you. Amen. All right. I think I, I have to stop here. I think I have to stop here. Somebody say process, process. determines yes. one's value. When I was a young minister, I used to preach all over the place. So they didn't bless me at all. But the time came. When they invite me to preach, when I finish preaching, they will bless me and even apologize for the offerings and say, Papa, if it is not enough, we will increase it. We want you to come again. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's good. It's good. The last time I preached for Bishop Jakes, When they sent me my check, I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it. In America. But I preached for him several times. I didn't get that kind of check. 
Hear me. Go through the process. In his time, he makes all things beautiful. Hear me. God has not called us to be powerful or anointed, gifted, or successful. He has called us to be faithful. And hear me. If you stay faithful, you will last. If you stay faithful, you will go places. God will blow your mind. Lord have mercy. I've been to places, so I've been places. I've seen dignity. I've seen things. A Nigerian businessman took me to his bedroom. And he opened a door. And every major currency in this world was there. And he said, I want you to know the man you are dealing with. And I said, sir, I just lost respect for you. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, if you expect me to deal with you on the grounds of material wealth, then you don't know and understand yourself. Because a man's life does not consist but the abundance of things that he possesses. We became friends for many years. I will not take anything from him. I won't take money from him. And one day he and his wife said to me, we've been wondering that everyone you've introduced to us, we've bought cars, we've done things for them, but we haven't done anything for you. And I said, it's to tell you one thing, that God is my source and you are not my source. When you come to a place in the ministry, where God is your source, it gives you the audacity to say whatever God wants you to say without an apology. And that is where God is bringing you to. And that is where you are going to come to. But go through the process. Celebrate others. When you see a man of God in your area building, take an offering and go and give it to him. Yeah. When you see a church in your community, in your area, somebody's been taking an offering. Tell your whole church, I want us to take an offering today after our tithe and offering and go and give it to Bishop Titi of First Church. So to others. Bless others. Teach your members how to bless others. You go far. But don't be selfish. Don't be self centered. Self self centered. Only looking out for yourself. Don't bless anybody. You don't tie to anybody. You don't give to anybody. And when you bring gifts to Bishop Titi of Ed, don't expect him to lay hands on you. Do it for some time. Be faithful and consistent for at least a year before you ask him to pour oil on your head. So people come now, they bring some small offering, then they kneel down. Papa, bless me. You think the blessing comes like that? What are you talking about? You can't buy the blessing. You can't buy it. But if you are faithful, if you are faithful, it is the Lord that will say, I need you to confer a blessing. For without contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And it's process. Go through the process. Go through the process. Don't build overnight. Don't take shortcuts. Shortcuts will cut you short. I pray that in the name of Jesus, none here that God himself have chosen will die prematurely. Amen. And I pray that there will be no victims or casualties among you. Amen. That there will be no casualty of any evil work among you. Amen. That the Lord shall deliver you from every evil work Amen. and preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom. Amen. And I pray for the supply of the spirit of God. That the spirit of God himself will come upon you. That the needed mantle and the needed oil shall come upon you. 
and that in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, each one of you shall receive divine capabilities to perform the duties, the duty for which you were given life and for which you were born. I pray that none among you shall lack what it requires to fulfill your mandate. That wherever you are, you will have what it takes to fulfill the mandate. That you have divine immunity and you have the supply of the spirit. The necessary supply, supernatural supply, supernatural provision, supernatural capabilities to perform and to deliver to the letter that for which you were called and chosen. I extend the blessing of the covenant to all of you here whom he has chosen. And any fifth column among us be arrested in the name of Jesus. Any fifth column in your ministry and in your life and in your marriage, let them be arrested in the name of Jesus. And between now and the end of this year, any programming and pregnancy in the womb of the enemy and in the womb of 2021 that will give the adversary an occasion to make a statement. Today in the name of Jesus, as we put our hands together, we terminate it right now. Come on, terminate it. Hear me. I want you, I want you to pray one prayer for me. Will you do that? All right. Second Samuel, chapter three, verse one. The Bible said there was a prolonged battle between the house of David and the house of Saul, but David waxed stronger and stronger. I have declared. By the inspiration of God, a hundred days of prayer. How many of you have heard about it? How many of you have registered? If you haven't registered, please register. And don't go and also declare a hundred days of prayer. Don't do that. Join what I have done. Join. Help me. Join. Don't stand alone. Don't say because it's not you and it's not your ministry, you won't join. Don't say... Our father wants all the glory. I don't want any glory. I'm just sick and tired of stubborn situation. I'm tired of unresolved issues. I'm tired of prolonged battles in our lives and the life of our children. Any battle that has been prolonged, let it come to an end in the name of Jesus. Within these 100 days, I want to see a performance of the word of the Lord. Say yes. And I want you to pray. That within these hundred days, it's a lot I'm doing. That I will work stronger and stronger and not weaker. Pray that prayer for me right now. Put your hands together. Pray that prayer. Declare it. Declare it, declare it. In the name of Jesus, say something, say something. Father, let your servant work stronger and stronger as the day goes by and not weaker. In the name of Jesus, open your declare it. One day somebody will pray for you. One day your children will pray for you. One day your sons will pray for you. 
sow a seed of prayer into the into the life of one ahead of you and the day shall come when you will need and you will reap it Amen. Please put 2 Timothy 4.18 on the screen. Let's see what the 2 Timothy 4.18. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 2 Timothy 4.18. Thank you, Lord. From every evil work. Yeah. I want you to pray this prayer. And I'm, I'm going to pray the same for you. Why should you pray it for me? I'm praying the same for you. That the Lord will deliver you and your ministry and your family from every evil work and preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom. As you pray that prayer for me, I'm praying the same for you. Put your hands together. Pray that prayer. I'm praying it for you. Father, I pray for your sons and your daughters. I pray for Bishop Titi Affair, his wife and his children. And this ministry, and all the pastors, the bishops, the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists that you have called and chosen here today, that you shall deliver them from every evil work. You shall deliver from every evil work and preserve them unto your heavenly kingdom. I pray in the name of Jesus that none among your people shall become a casualty or, yes, Lord. Yes, or a victim of any evil work. Let them and their house and their ministry and their children, wives, husbands, be delivered. <laughs> delivered. Let them be delivered from every evil work. Delivered from every evil work. Delivered from ill wills. Delivered from projections. Delivered from manipulation. Delivered from the works of the enemy. By all means, delivered at all times, preserved unto your heavenly kingdom. In the name of Jesus, deliver. We command your deliverance. Command your deliverance. Enforce your deliverance. Command your deliverance from every evil work. And declare that you are preserved unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Lift up your hands. I declare by divine authority from the throne room perspective from where all authority over heaven and earth is derived I declare the Lord deliver you and your house the Lord deliver you and your ministry the Lord deliver you and your children from every evil work the Lord preserve you and all that concerns you until the coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Put your hands together and God bless you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. I look forward. I look forward to coming back to you and see you again in the flesh next year about the same time. Amen. Father, for these men, how come there's no women among them? We need gender balance. Next year, let's get some women. Amen. Without women, we won't be here. None of us will be here. The womb of a woman is a legal entry to the planet. Nobody comes here without the womb of a woman. And God is not the God of gender. So next time, let's have some women here. Father, forgive us for ignoring the women. Now let these, your servants, be empowered. Teach their hands how to war and to do battle. Empower them to run through troops, to leap over walls, and let each one of them be true ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Let none among them fall on the grounds of battle. Let none fall by the sword of the enemy, 
nor the sword of the brethren. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you. Put your hands together for them. God bless you. Well, you know what? I have an appointment at three. I would have loved to spend the whole day with you. Just to pour out and share with you. And hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Whatever I shared with you is out of love. Because I wish I had one many years ahead of me like you have me and others. I would have been better than I am today. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful. And what I have learned has made me wiser and better. And I pray that your latter will be better Amen. and greater Amen. than your past. Wherever you've come from and wherever God has called you to, may you flourish. May you be fruitful. May you multiply. And may you walk in that anointing of multiplication. An increase in everything. And may you never lack nor want whatever resources it requires to glorify the Father and to do the will of God. Blessings. Please be seated. I look forward to seeing you again, like I said, next year. Next year. In the flesh. Say, I will see the Archbishop. Next year. About the same time. In the flesh. I'll see you.